crazy town. The reason why I tell you this is, does any of it sound familiar? America had been fundamentally transformed in a very relatively short period of time, and Americans were freaking out. When Wilson starts, gets in, the income tax is 7%. Right, and then it goes during the war at 77. I think they take it down to 70 when he leaves. That year is also uh, a year of tremendous strikes. There's, there's, uh, it's one of the great strike-ridden years of labor unrest in the country. And it's also a year of domestic terrorism. That's when you had the Wall Street bombing, which has been, you heard yeah. about with the Times Square bombing. <laughs> and also you had bombings of the attorney general's office, of, of, uh, of his home, excuse me, which uh, ends up uh, blowing body parts into the roof of the next door neighbor's house or across the street, Franklin D. Roosevelt. I mean, things are a mess. And what is Wilson doing? He's obsessing about the, uh, a new world order, the League of Nations, uh, creating this thing, this sort of Philip Drew administrator world situation, and ignores this thing as the country is going to hell in a handbasket. Okay, so um, America is freaking out, and they know they don't want any of this progressive nightmare. Um, and so they have to change um, presidents. And they vote for Warren G. Harding. He sure. serves how long? He serves until August 2, 1923. Okay. But, but he dies Glenn, of a heart uh, There's one event here that we're missing, which is there was a police strike in Boston at this time, an example of new union power and progressive power. And the policemen were underpaid, so it was a compelling strike. But Coolidge, the governor overseeing the police commissioner, said these people are striking and we're having trouble in Boston, chaos, people being hurt, maybe killed. And he said there is no right to strike against the public safety by anyone, anywhere, anytime. This was Governor Coolidge. And the country heard and said, someone has drawn the line. The unions can only go so far and not farther. There's no right is to strike amazing? against the public safety. And that woke the country up. Look at the similarities here. Look at the um, uh, mid-1900s, you know, or 1916, 1970 to 1920. Look at that time period. The 1930s under FDR, another progressive. <clears throat> then you go to the 1960s under uh, JFK and especially um, uh, LBJ. Um, and then now you have these giant progressive periods. And look what they all have in common. They all have civil unrest, horrible, horrible economies, um, war, terrorism, some sort of domestic terrorism, and unions that are absolutely running everything out of control. That's significant, isn't it? Shouldn't people notice that every time we have these progressive giants, these exact things come into play? So, they exploit crises. Right. And Coolidge's time period where people say nothing happened. I think there's an old saying that the happiest days of mankind are written on the blank pages of history. So yes, there is no war with Coolidge. And you know, there could have been a war. There were, there were adventures of John J. Pershing galloping into Mexico under Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. He settled that down. He settled that down. He brought the troops home from Nicaragua with, with the earliest Sandinistas. Uh, he worked towards outlawing war, war in treaties. He worked with the world court, but there were no great crises what, what, because that's not the, the measure. The measure is often what you avoid. Was he um, progressive at, at all? Was there any part of him progressive? Because he doesn't seem to... Progressives on the Republican side tend to um, go out and, and do war, but war yeah. as Americans, led by Americans, Theodore Roosevelt, where the progressives on the Democratic side go out and do war under an international umbrella. So it w was, was he progressive at all, not just on war? I, I would say he was liberal in the classical liberal sense. That is, he stood up for the individual. Libertarian. You, liberal in the European right, sense. Right, right, right. Which is, he stood up for women. When women got the vote just around then, and he was a big uh, fan of women. He appointed women, but not as a group, as individuals. Not, right. Just as Ward Connerly would say, blacks are Americans, not a, a political group. As individuals, he was a big help to blacks in the same way. Let them be citizens uh, like the rest. Yeah, let's go back to, let's just stop here at, 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 at blacks. Because Woodrow Wilson, this progressive, right. was a nightmare when it came to African Americans. An absolute nightmare. Um, 
you know, I don't need to get into Coolidge, it, when Coolidge is, is uh, Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, he, he gives a talk, and he's talking about the war, and he says, the German government is, has been knocking us, and they've been knocking the fact that we have colored troops in Europe fighting alongside uh, in, in other units with us. And I would hope that when we finally accept the surrender of the Kaiser's government, we will have a contingent of colored troops around. When he was uh, running for office in 1924, he didn't really speak out against the Klan, but what he did was he went and spoke to the B'nai B'rith. He went to spoke to the Knights of Columbus, and he delivered a graduating address at the all-black Howard University. When he goes and dedicates the World War I memorial in Kansas City, which is a very southern-like town, uh, he insists that a, a detachment of black troops from Leavenworth, uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, accompany him. Which, again, is a complete reversal of... Woodrow Wilson, the term, I, I, keep, I, I, I keep passing over Harding, and Harding was important, but, but Coolidge was Harding's vice president. Right. And Harding dies in office. And didn't his father swear Coolidge in? Absolutely. When, when, when Harding dies, he's on a, a great western trip. He's up in Alaska. He comes down to California. He takes ill dies after a few days of being holed up in a hotel room in, in San Francisco, they bring the news to Calvin Coolidge. And as I said earlier, he comes from this little town in, in Vermont, Plymouth Notch, and the place is so isolated, there's no phone. The Vice President of the United States is vacationing there with his father on the old homestead. They have to drive 10 to 12 miles to get to the place to 1 in the morning to let the Vice President know he's going to be the President of the United States. They swear him in because he says, he's a very practical man, he says, we can't go without a president very long. Who can do this? My father's a notary. My father's <laughs> a notary. He calls the Department of State. Can, can a notary do it? Yes. And they, they eventually do it again, just I, in case. But they do it by kerosene light. There is no electricity, no phone at this place. This is really important, that it's kerosene light. And I'll explain why, and I think it will give you um, a, a, a little hope on what we're facing today. We see the parallels on the setup, and remember, kerosene lamps. We'll give that to you next. We're talking about one of my favorite U.S. presidents, Calvin Coolidge. This is a seat cushion. Oh, there's some president's faces that belong, well, never mind. <laughs> um, that's, no, well, no, it's not. I was going to say that's beneath me, but really it's not. Um, we want to talk about Calvin Coolidge, and if you want to learn more about him after this show, log on to glennbeck.com and sign up for the Insider Extreme account. We have a brand new special posted on the website today called The Truth About Calvin Coolidge. Uh, it's at glennbeck.com. Do it now. We're back with Calvin Coolidge biographers, uh, David Petrusha and also Amity Schles. Um, and I want to talk um, here where we left it off. I think everybody, everybody has the point that it's a lot like today. When he comes into office, it's a lot like today. And people are freaking out. you got this gigantic government going completely in the other direction. And then Calvin Coolidge is brought in. Well, actually, actually Harding. 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 And the, the taxes are cut under Harding like to, from 70 to 56 percent. And then... Coolidge ratchets it is up even and more. And there's another guy named Mellon that's involved. He's the Treasury... Treasury, Secretary. Andrew J. Right, um, and he's the uh, Carnegie Mellon guy. Yeah. Yeah, and also then later vilified and persecuted under seriously, FDR. Seriously, seriously. Seriously persecuted under FDR. But he comes in, and he's kind of the genius behind it all, and he says, you got to cut taxes, you got to cut spending. They do a little bit. They do quite a bit, actually. Uh, and things start to move in the right direction, right? They really do. You know, unemployment is 3.3% during Coolidge's six years. The gross national product increases by 7%. Per capita income grows by 30%. Real well, hang on, earnings hang on, hang on. We get up the, by 22%. But I, I, hang on. I think the point to make here is that it wasn't easy for Mellon and Coolidge and Harding before to get these tax cuts through. We think of it as obvious and now it's impossible. But they worked very hard. They wrote books. They sold them to people. And recall, at that time, most people didn't pay the income tax. So they were voting for tax cuts for rich people. And that's a very hard sell for politicians. 
And nonetheless, it works.